So this morning, we're going to continue on with the Jordan series, and we're at that point where they're crossing over, and we have touched upon it a little bit. And so this morning, I'm going to camp on the part of memorials, because it's a very strategic part within that crossing over. And see, We've already gone through the part where Joshua said, prepare yourself, get yourself ready, begin to make provisions, for tomorrow the Lord is going to do amazing wonders among you. And I can't help but to think that's where we are prophetically, that's where we are as a congregation, that's where we are as a people right now with the Lord, is that he is declaring from heaven, and most in every angle that you can find, I am about ready to do amazing wonders among you. And see, in our hearts that should create an excitement because that means things that we've been sowing, things that we've been believing for, things that we've been warring for, for year after year after year, God is about ready to bring forth into the earth this year, this day, and this hour. See, this morning I feel that very, very strong, and it's not just some sort of hype and token. It's not a fortune cookie that I read that said God's going to do something. It's what I feel in my spirit that as I believe and I'm praying about this year and I'm praying for you guys that he begins to say, this is the year. This is the year of the Lord. This is the year of his favor. This is the year that what you've been believing for is going to happen. In that there's still some more instruction for us. And so this morning I want to take a moment and let's begin to read out of Joshua 4. So this morning it says, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from every tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests were standing and in the midst of the Jordan, carry them out of the pile. I'm sorry, carry them out and pile them up at the place which you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men that he had chosen, one from each tribe of Israel, and he told them, go into the middle of the Jordan, in front of the ark of your Lord your God. Each of you must pick up a stone and carry it on your shoulder, 12 stones, one in all, one for each 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Then you will tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So then men, I'm sorry, so the men did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the river Jordan, one from each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Joshua set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they are there to this day. Verse 10, the priests who were carrying the Ark stood in the middle of the river until all of the Lord's commands that Moses Commands that Moses had given Joshua were carried out. Meanwhile, the people hurried across the riverbed. And when everyone was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the ark of the Lord as the people watched. And then if you skip down to verse 19, it says, The people crossed the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped at Gilgal, just east of Jericho. It was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones that were taken from the river Jordan. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Then you will tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes and he will keep it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea. And when he dried it, it all up until they had all crossed over. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the hand, the Lord's hand is powerful and so that you might fear the Lord, your God, forever. So this morning there's a lot going on in this. 
They began to be obedient, to listen to what the word of the Lord said through Joshua. They began to go across. The 12 men were ready to do what their commander had said to them, and that was get the stones. See, this morning, if we're going to look at a memorial, we have to define it. And it says that this, a memorial out of Webster says, serving to preserve remembrance, a person, event, or a structure. See, we can all think of the Washington National Monument Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial. We have Mount Rushmore, these are all very big memorials that have been constructed by the hands of men. And they all signify different things for this country and and the freedoms that we have and the beliefs that we stand for. But see, if we're going to take a moment to look at that, we have to remember that our lives are not dictated by the world that we're in. They're dictated by another kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God. So when the Bible begins to talk about a memorial in the same way that our children go to school, and they learn out of our history books what has happened, the same way we need to take the memorial and the reverence of what God has begun to say and construct in an event, in a person, in a structure, and apply it into our life. See, we don't live on this world as this is our home. We live in this world as we are passing through. And what are we constructing along the way that is crying out, that says to the generation around us and the world around us, there is a God and today you will all know the wonders and the works that He does because of the memorial that He is constructing. See, we have to be intentional about the memorials around us. Why is it a big deal that Joshua called 12 men? We all know that it represented each man from each tribe. That means there was always a priest. There was always someone out of that tribe that God can look to and hold accountable to say, is your tribe remembering the work? Do they remember what I did in their midst? See, when they began the journey to begin to cross over the Jordan, they were told to stay a distance away from the ark. And some believe that distance is actually about a half mile distance between the ark and the people. But see, Joshua told them through the word of the Lord, go unto the place and from where the which the ark stands and grab these stones. There had to have been a moment of doubt in that moment. To Joshua, we are to stay away from the ark, but yet you're saying go and grab a stone from which where the priests are standing. We don't see that recorded. We see obedience and action going forth. Their priests did what they had to do. Joshua was doing what he had to do. But now the Lord gave another instruction, and now these 12 men needed to do what the Lord had told them to do. So we all have a choice whether or not we're going to do what the Lord says to do. And in that moment, they, they had to be obedient and take that step of faith and go, okay, I'm going to go grab those stones. And see, when you think about a stone, the stones that I have here in front is probably, and there's 12 of them, this is probably about altogether the size of one stone. Because in the Word, when it begins to talk about put a stone upon your shoulder, carry something the weight as much as a man can carry, it's talking about what a man could carry in that day and age. And in that time, most men were able to carry anywhere from 50 to 70 pounds just carrying. He said, and take it unto the camp that I'm going to have you go tonight. He didn't say, once you cross the Jordan, drop them there and you're good. He said, take them unto the camp. (laughs) The camp was eight miles away. So they're taking these stones upon their shoulders along with everything else that they have Because they're moving their whole nation across the Jordan. We're not just thinking like, oh, there's a home on the other side already prepared. They went on vacation. They left everything there. No. They're taking everything with them. 
And so they're carrying these stones and they're tending their children and they're carrying their stock and everything to go eight miles away to begin to set up camp just outside the fields of Jericho. See, God wanted to make sure that the memorial was in a place that would continually be seen as a remembrance of what they, he did that day. When he, st- he had them create that memorial, little did Jericho know, but they were probably looking at the rock formations of what God had begun to put there as cover and as hiding before they began to walk into the land and begin to circle around the camp. They were familiar with the landscape, but these stones helped them blend in. So much purpose beside of just the miracle, it preserved them into the next step. So why are memorials so important? Why is a memorial a big deal to God? This isn't the first time that we began to see the Lord say, construct a memorial. Remember what I'm telling you. Because we have to remember a memorial is not just a structure, but it's an event. It's also a remembrance of something. So this morning, we have to take the moment and look at our life and say, what is the memorial that my life is? And am I remembering what God has spoken to me? See, in Exodus, you don't have to turn there, but Exodus 12, 23 through 25, it says, For the Lord will pass through to slay the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lentil and the two side posts the lord will pass over the door and he will not dis- and the destroy not allow sorry the destroyer to come into your house to slay you you shall observe this right as an ordinance to you and your sons forever when you come to the land which the lord will give you he has promised you you shall keep this service You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover for which he passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt when he slew the Egyptians but spared our houses. And it says, the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Your sons forever. Your sons forever. This will be a reminder to you when you get to the promised land. See, back in Exodus, he was already preparing the Israelites for what he was going to do at the River Jordan. In Deuteronomy, again, uh, 6, 20 through 25, we begin to see this remembrance played out. And when your sons ask you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and precepts which the Lord your God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed the signs and wonders, great and evil against Egypt, against Pharaoh and his household before our eyes. And then he brought us out of from there, that he might bring us into the land which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to reverently fear the Lord our God in our good ways, that he might preserve us alive. It is this day that it will be accounted as righteousness, conformity to God's will and word in thought and action. For if we are watchful to do his commands before the Lord our God, he has commanded us. See, this morning it's, a memorial. It's a remembrance. And we have to continually begin to remember the works and the wonders of the Lord. See, when they say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it is a constant reminder of who their God is and who they serve. And it is also a declaration unto the land and who they're coming before. Do you know my God? Do you know who I serve? Because it's the God of Jacob and Isaac. It is the God of Abraham. And you know those men. And you know what the Lord did in the midst of them. It is a proud proclamation. It is a declaration. It is a fervency and excitement of a roar that comes up within inside. It is my God that did this. It is my God that delivered me from your hand and set me up to walk into the promised land. That is the God we serve. 
That is the memorial that when we wake every day should be constructing and erupting from our mouths in praise. Because we have a, a call to action when we look at a memorial. And that is to continually speak forth what God did. See, it's not just to remember a great story of the past, but it's a constantly reminder of what the greater future is ahead. We have to take that good news of the cross, the resurrection, and his power and speak it forth as remembrance. See, some of you might not be called to be a pastor or an evangelist, Okay, we look at those or quotes within those. But there is something that you all are called to do. And that is to bring forth the remembrance of who your God is and who you serve to your family. So yes, you are a pastor and you are an evangelist. Because you don't have to have a title and a business card to be so. But the Lord is very clear that take your remembrance. And when your children begin to ask you, why do you do what you do? Why is it that you come early and set up? Why is it that you go to Friday nights and pray? Why is it that you get up early to spend time with the Lord? Why is it that you spend your business differently than other people? Why is it that you don't allow me to do these things but everyone else can? Because we must always teach those around us and our children and the next generation of who our God is and how that is to live and what that means. It doesn't just come naturally. See, we're born into this world, into our sinful nature. We're not born coming into the kingdom. We don't have to learn how to lie, cheat, steal. We don't have to learn how to do any of those things. They just come naturally. Look at our children. They just do things and they hide it. They're no different than Adam and Eve. They knew they did wrong, and they tried to hide it. But we have to teach them the ways of the Lord. And we do that through the cultivation of the Holy Spirit. And we do that by erecting memorials and remembrance in our daily lives, constantly before our family. This morning, I want to encourage you, who is our God? Who is our God? Isaiah 44, 6 through 8 says, The Lord who rules and protects Israel, the Lord Almighty, I has to say this, I am the first and the last, the only God. There is no other God but me. Could anyone else have done what I did? Could have, who could have predicted? predicted all that would happen from the very beginning to the end of time. Do not be afraid, my people. You know that the, from the ancient times until now, I have predicted all that would happen, and you are my witnesses. Is there any other God? Is there someone powerful, some powerful God that I have not heard of? <laughs> See, God is speaking into a generation of the time of Isaiah where they had all gone away, and they're all chasing after other gods, and they've begun to forget what God did back at the River Jordan. They've begun to forget what happened with Abraham. They've begun to lose their sight of the memorial of who, what God did. See, the God we serve is powerful. The God we serve is righteous. It's funny as you look through Isaiah 6 when Isaiah reveals, is revealed the throne room, when Ezekiel's revealed the throne room, when John's revealed the throne room. It's not a different story. It's just added on. It's the same thing that they all saw. Eyes of fire, smoke, thunders and lightnings, cherubim and seraphim, angels and creatures, all worshiping the created the creator God. Sorry, I almost messed that one up. It's all about him and his splendor and his majesty. See, do we forget that we are nothing but a speck in the palm of his hand? 
He says he holds the world in his hand, the universe, all that we are trying to discover as mere men and mortals of what's still out there. He can look at his hand and see it all. The vastness and the expanse of our God knows no end. There's a reason why he can say time does not hold me because I created time. There's a reason why he can say the end before the beginning and the beginning before the end because he is not held by time. See, we have to remember, and in this morning I'm just trying to encourage our spirits, remember the memorial of who God is. But the problem lies is we're just one generation away from the church closing their door. Are we willing to declare the works of the Lord no matter what it costs? See, this morning I felt it so strong and it says that we will declare that this is not going to happen. And at Lifesong we are being intentional about making disciples and sharing the gospel with our friends, family, and those around us. Do you want to see the Holy Spirit poured out on all flesh? Then declare with me that we will see God's power manifested in our lives and upon the earth. Why? Because we will never stop telling of God's goodness, His love, His grace, and His power, and His ability to set you free. See, the days of what they experienced are not over. It is not over. We are just beginning to pick up where they left off and where the church fell asleep. We're about ready to step into another great awakening of the Spirit of God being unleashed upon the earth. And it says, I am not a respecter of person, but I will pour my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. See, it is not dead. It is not gone away. It is still alive. And the Spirit says this morning that it is time to believe. The memorial of our life has to speak louder than the culture around us. The memorial of our life has to speak louder than the culture around us because they're not getting quieter. And they're not going to be. If we read as you get into Revelation and you read what Paul and Silas went through and what the disciples went through, it is not that it's not going to happen again. It is happening still. They just learned how to cover it up. We have to proclaim our God aloud. We have to tell the world who he is. Because they're not going to find him on their own. I'm not saying that God can't reveal himself. But see, he birthed you into the earth for this hour and this time for a reason. And that is to further his kingdom and to bring forth what has already been done in heaven and manifested on this earth. We're not here to play church. We're not here to play games with our God. See, the Israelites later on began to worship the memorial and had to send prophets to correct them because they stopped worshiping the memorial maker and worshiped the memorial. And this morning, we have to, we can't just get excited about memorials, but we have to also take a moment and look in our life of. Are we worshiping the memorial maker or are we worshiping the memorial? Have we lost sight? Have we lost focus? Has our eyes become tainted? Have they become dim? Has the edge of being excited to share the gospel with someone become a back seat? Something that we take off the shelf every now and then. See, something that I I didn't think that I have, that I'm evangelistic But the Lord's been wrecking my world to the point where someone will make a comment about God at work. And I don't care. I just say, no, you're wrong in that. A coworker made a comment. I can't find Jesus. Well, then stop hiding from him. Because he's been speaking to you the whole time. if If you're acknowledging that you're running from someone, then come on. He's obviously put things in your path to reveal who he is. And see, before, I just wouldn't say anything. Eh. 
but it grieved my spirit because I've begun to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit to go when and where. Do you want me to say something? Is it now or then? And as we begin to draw ourselves closer into the throne room, the idea of evangelizing and evangelism, we don't put on someone else. We become like Isaiah and it says, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me. Send me because there are those around me that need to hear your gospel. There are those that are perishing that if I don't open my mouth, that someone might just slip away and go to hell. We have to allow our life to be a memorial that burns bright. It has to burn bright. We can no longer be a people that are afraid and timid about the God that we serve. It has to exude from us. Isaiah 44, 9 through 10 says, All who make graven images... And idols are confusion, chaos, and worthlessness. Their objects, idols in which they delight, do not profit them. And their own witnesses and worshipers do not see or know that they are put to shame. Who is such as a fool as to fashion a god or cast a graven image that is profitable for nothing? We have to take the time to look at the images around us, the things that we're putting before us. Have they become a graven image? Have they become something constructed with our hands that we hold higher than the Word? Do we hold it higher than when the Spirit says, hey, cut off the TV for a moment. Just spend 10 minutes with me. 10 minutes with me. Jesus said, can you not tarry an hour? Can you not watch and wait with me for an hour? See, the Spirit wants to do what the Lord has placed him on this earth to do, but he cannot do it if we are unwilling to yield ourselves unto him and take that moment and remove the graven images and remove the idols out of our lives and erect the memorial of Christ and put it back before him and said, you know what? It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that I serve, that my house serves. We have to declare these things. A declaration isn't just a fun thing that we can do and shout about. It holds power and meaning. And especially for those that know him. When we begin to decree and declare, we decree and declare the words of our creator. We don't decree and declare our own flesh. We're decreeing out of the spirit of Christ that lives within you, that aroma of Christ that is a fragrance unto our Father. So when we begin to speak, we speak with that authority and that boldness that backs us. This morning as we talk about memorials and constantly speaking forth the word, can you come play keys? There's something that stuck, a couple of things that really, really stuck out to me in the, in the latter part of those scriptures. And it says that Joshua went back in and he created a second memorial right on the riverbank. The faith that it took to say, God, I believe in what you have called me to do that I'm going to make another memorial that says in this river that was once dry, in this river, I'm going to build another altar, another memorial unto you that still stands there to this day. That's what it says. I'll read it again for you. Joshua four nineteen through 24. No. Sorry, uh, it's back in Joshua 4. Uh, let me get there. I don't know. It says in Joshua 9, thank you. I'm trying to find it on here. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Joshua set up another pile of 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they're there to this day. Joshua wanted to make sure that there was always another remembrance of what God did. See, it took faith to build that. It's in the middle of a river. At some point, that river is going to come back, and it's going to wash everything away. See, the word says it's still there to this day. So when this, the word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was given unto men to give unto us, it's true this day. That forever God will look down, and he is put on remembrance of what he did and the declaration that he said he would do for his people. He's always reminded of it. Always put back in remembrance. See, we have the word today. At any point, we can open this up. We can find it online. We can put it on our phone. We have so much access to the word. But back then, all they had was the stories that they would say. What was remembered from generation to generation that was passed down. So how does faith come? Faith comes by the word and hearing the word. The evidence of things not seen. Generations to come didn't always see what they saw. But they always had that memorial that they can come back to. This day. On this day, our God not only delivered us out of the land of Egypt, but on that day, he took us across the Jordan. And now we are led by his presence, the Ark of the Covenant. See, we must fully trust him. We must always continually be speaking forth the word and declaration. Always. Always. It says, I'll write it upon your hearts. Let the word not proceed, depart from your lips. Let it continually come forth. Let it continue to praise. Let it continually bubble over. We have to be a people that speaks forth the word of God. So again, I ask the question of, is your life a living memorial? Are you living in a way that the next generation wants to know the God you serve? Are the memorials in your life pushing your family and children closer to the Lord? Or are they pushing them away? We have to make sure that we're not just running our lives how we want. We have to make sure that we're constantly intentional about what we're speaking forth over our children, what we're speaking forth with our families. See, memorials are not designed to keep us living in the past. We can often get stuck on the former reign that we have all been a part of, some of us. But we must use the past as a stepping stone to the latter reign of what is about ready to be unleashed. There is still a greater memorial yet to come. There is still a greater memorial yet to come. See, I, I'm believing. And when it says the Holy Spirit came in with fire upon their heads and a mighty rushing wind, that a day not too far, far from now that that is happening, that that Spirit is rushing in into our churches, it is rushing in into our city, it is rushing in into our businesses, it is rushing in into our homes, and it is overtaking us with tongues of fire. The power of God manifested on the earth, being made visible for all to see, all to see. See, they were, there was no mistaking where the Israelites were when God's leading them by night in a pillar of fire and a cloud by day. All could see. All could see. There's no wonder that when they crossed over the Jordan that Jericho began shaking in their boots because they knew who was about ready to come on scene. 
That's the God we serve. And that's the same God that wants to do stuff in the earth today that was done then. It's not over, folks. It is not over. I believe it's so strong in my spirit that we have not even begun to scratch the surface in our service alone, let alone what the world around outside of these four walls are going to see by the power and the move of God. And it comes from you. It comes from you.